Good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be here uh, for another Wood Solutions um, webinar. I've had the benefit of um, uh, participating in many of these before, like you are now. So um, now I've got the job of um, trying to keep you informed and educated, hopefully over the next 45 minutes. Um, so I'm quite passionate about the use of timber and I'll get into my presentation now and uh, hopefully share with you this morning. Uh, so that's now up on the screen, Alistair. Yeah, that's all good, Mark, so go ahead. Terrific, excellent. So the topic of my presentation today is to get the ultimate timber benefits uh, through using wood. And um, this is something that uh, I, I feel very strongly about and hope to share with you some of my experiences over practice, the over, um, a number of years. So just getting my slides going, which for some reason are not happening. Just, yeah, just click on the screen and then try again. Sometimes they lock up on the first one, yep. Yeah, they seem to have, so. Right, yep, excellent. Yeah, for some reason they do lock up. So look, to start off with today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of um, uh, where, where I am at the moment, which is in Brisbane. And they are the Purrible people, the Jagera people, the Gar Garable people and the Jagera people. And I think it's important to acknowledge elders past and present and recognize the sovereignty of their land, that the sovereignty of their land was never ceded. And I envisage a community where justice, awareness and equity form the basis of a regenerative environment for future generations. And I think it is important to acknowledge uh, where we've come from. And, um, and today, um, what I'd like to do is to give you a general overview of the benefits of timber that I've come across to give you my perspective on why Australian timber is so important, why we should be using it and promoting it to share with you the issues that we all have with timber and to hopefully make sure we don't overlook them like we're conscious of what we do, uh, to talk about how we get the maximum benefits and to give you some tips on um, things that I've learnt over the years to make using timber easier. So each piece of wood can be unique in grain, colour and line. And so as a designer, this is an amazing material to work with. So we understand the general benefits of wood as being lightweight but strong. Uh, it's easy to process, to finish, to maintain, to repair. And more recently, we've come to understand through life cycle assessments that wood outperforms many other materials in terms of embodied energy, air and water pollution, and has a much lower carbon footprint. So in summary, there are many benefits in using wood and um, benefits in construction are that it's generally safe, easy to work with, cost-effective, versatile, and is naturally anti-corrosive. And of course, the uses for timber are multifold. Um, we're using a regularly form work for landscape purposes, uh, for structural purposes, and uh, we're seeing more and more the use of timber internally for wall linings. Traditionally, it's always been used for joinery, but we're seeing many new furniture forms adopting the benefits of wood. So in my, my own story is um, uh, dealing with wood uh, in my own home. And uh, literally 20 years ago, I designed this home in the outskirts of Brisbane. Um, with the eco residents standing for ecological and healthy. And my objective for myself and my family was to design the most environmentally friendly home that I could. And it was timber that I moved towards in terms of understanding if we provide the best opportunities in uh, delivering that outcome. Uh, so, but for me, was something that I had used before, but never used as extensively as I did in my own home. 
One of the reasons for that was, um, as I said, because of its environmental qualities. And I ended up designing an engineered timber home using predominantly plywood and using it for internal surfaces uh, structurally and pretty well right through the home. It's, it's effectively a plywood home. And one of the amazing things uh, that I learned was using a structurally stable material like marine plywood, which is effectively what was the predominant material in my home, I could actually prefabricate it and get accuracy and get design detailing done in a way that was not possible on site. This is my home um, outlaid at the Construction Training Centre in Brisbane, where my builder um, secured space to, to basically pre-assemble. And I call this hybrid construction because, um, as you can see, most of the home was panelised and then delivered it to site and assembled. I guess it was the detailed detailing that I went through with my builder to look at how how timber was used and how to get the maximum value and benefit from it. Um, and I, I learned that the detailing of timber is particularly important and ventilation and um, uh, detailing is essential. Uh, one of the problems we're seeing with a lot of timber use in this day and age, particularly as we move towards passive housing is that there's not enough ventilation provided or some of the timber joints. So in the case of my own home, this was elevated up off the air and we use very conventional details to um, provide durability for the timber and for termite protection. As, as I said, it's a, um, a lightweight um, plywood home where we use timber structurally and used uh, uh, LVL basically as all the uh, structural materials. You can see on the slide on the right that um, the timber outrigger that was supporting the roof and uh, use a, a glass cap on the end just to uh, completely protect the end grain of the timber. So we went to a fair bit of detail and consideration and uh, most of the upper parts of this building are protected by the roof cladding or um, uh, roof sheeting of some type. So it was a very deliberate attempt to look at how we use timber, how we could get the maximum benefit from it, and how we could come up with detailing that was um, quite cost effective and quite easy to install. 20 years later, um, I've, uh, I, I lived in the home for 10 years and 20 years later is a slide on the right whereby the house has been uh, painted and I guess one of the maintenance issues that I've come to understand with timber is that unless you really understand how the timber is going to be in five, 10 and 20 years time, you may not be getting the most benefit from it. So in my case, the finishes that I chose initially were a clear stained um, uh, ester pole. And I myself had recoded the house at least once, but the cost of doing that on a long-term basis, the current owners made the decision to, uh, to change that. And so now the house structurally is as uh, good as it ever has been, but it has a different appearance due to the, uh, an easier maintenance regime by using different finishes. And I guess the flexibility of the system that we used uh, for my home was then developed to look at a few other simple buildings that my office was involved in at the time. Um, and the benefits that we found were using smaller sheets, uh, having um, using smaller panels, I should say, and using plywood in particular whereby we can assemble it very simply and effectively just using either jacks and a couple of people. So this became a very cost-effective way of building. The, the guitar building system, which was the basis of both my home and a number of buildings that I've done since, is effectively a structural timber plywood solution. And it's generally clad with um, other to achieve um, its protection. 
This is the Logan Waste Administration Building, which um, also embraced a whole lot of environment and demonstrated how we could use timber in a very cost-effective manner. And it's interesting because engineered timber and marine plywood, as many of you know, are not the, um, uh, not the cheapest materials to use from a timber point of view. What I've learnt is if you use these materials really efficiently, they become very cost effective. Now, the home I moved into 10 years later was an older Queenslander. So, once again, timber was a dominant uh, material in this home. And I did a major extension uh, to this home uh, to satisfy the needs of my family. It was very hard to leave my first home, but I found that uh, as it was on the outskirts of Brisbane, the challenges of living sustainably meant that I needed to reduce my transportation burden um, and uh, both on my family and on the environment and move a little closer into town. So uh, buying a traditional Queenslander uh, seemed to be the obvious choice. And I guess in the extension work that I did, I made sure that I used timber as extensively as I could. So instead of using gyprock, which is the conventional internal material that we're using residentially, I've used again uh, plywood. And um, I find this particularly useful in domestic work because it gives the ability to sort of hang and use the walls of the building in a way that you can't if you were using gyprock. You can see my son's rooms here. I created um, spaces over the cupboards and uh, a little loft. Um, um, it was all done in the carpentry trade and made uh, by, by reducing the number of trades that you have on a project, you can actually increase costs and uh, decrease costs to get the maximum benefit from using the one material. So again, even in this new home, although completely different from a design point of view, I was successful in being able to use timber in ceilings, floors, used uh, new timber windows. Uh, and again, all of these materials were selected and certified and chosen for their environmental qualities as well as their cost efficiencies. During both building processes, I, I struggle occasionally and found that when you are really quite adamant about using timber, particular types of timber, there's a lot of people out there that will actually tell you what you want to hear. So unless you are quite fastidious about making sure that you're getting what you're specifying, people will substitute uh, um, things and often you'll be told that things are not available, so you're offered another alternative. So it's particularly important that you make sure that you are aware of what timber is available at the time you're building, because otherwise you'll most likely be constantly challenged to ensure that, um, uh, sorry, you'll be constantly challenged with other alternatives. And inevitably you might find that those other alternatives don't have the same qualities that your originally specified material had. So you need to be, you need to investigate this and you need to work with your timber suppliers and your builders to make sure that the timber you're after is all available, always available. The other thing that's quite important to understand is that the timber that we are using a lot in furniture and the timber that's available in retail outlets is not always the timber that you might think. So for much of the furniture that I've used in our homes over the years, I've always tried to use recycled timber. And I've learned many valuable lessons that recycled teak and recycled um, timbers generally, the way they're promoted is that they may not be all of the timber in a particular piece. So I've had a number of discussions with people in retail stores to actually uh, make sure that I am getting recycled timber because it's not uncommon for furniture to have a recycled badge, but you can find that only 20% of, sorry, only 80% of the timber is recycled and the other 20% might be virgin rainforest timber. So um, it's really important to understand the timber you're using and, and where it's coming from. 
And as I've learnt in using Kimba so extensively, to understand the maintenance of it is another factor because as you're working and living with the material itself, it has these amazing benefits, but unless you maintain it correctly, you don't get the maximum advantages of those benefits. So I'm passionate about uh, making sure that we uh, are working within our means in our environment. More recently, uh, like many of you, I've come across the concept of regenerative design. This is a real shift in thinking uh, from sustainable design, which is what uh, I've always been advocating, work towards a whole new approach where we need to be regenerative. So that means we need to continue to reuse uh, materials and hopefully uh, have a less of a burden on the planet by continually sourcing new materials. So the regenerative design approach is, is something that I think we all need to study in a bit more detail. And this is uh, a particularly favourite project of mine, which is designed for deconstruction. This is by Architects Architectus, and it's at the Macquarie University in New South Wales. What's particularly interesting to me about this is this concept of design for deconstruction. So it's actually using materials in a way that they are assembled, can be disassembled and reused time and time again. And this is one of the unique things that to me, timber and one of the amazing benefits that timber can provide because its life can go well beyond the life that it's first used for. And in seeing projects like this, I've come to understand that you do need to understand it doesn't happen accidentally. So one of the ways is to minimising building design uh, complexity to make sure that you uh, use there's a great demand for composite materials in buildings these days. And I'm really concerned with this trend because composite materials are very difficult to recycle. So uh, I think it's really important to minimize the different types of materials that you use. And timber seems to be the perfect material to be able to use in many different ways in a structure. Um, and also, if you use them in a way that is valuable, they are worth recovering. But the other thing that's important is to make sure that the records of your designs are actually kept. And the as-built drawings, which is something we've all become aware of in the building industry recently, uh, the requirement to deliver as-built drawings, it's important to put records on of timber and where that timber is from. So in summary, to leave clues for future owners and builders that you've considered that this material can be reused and potentially recovered in the future. And I don't know about you, but this is a completely different way of thinking about how we design buildings. And this is what I call a regenerative or a restorative approach to the building, which I'm excited to think is something that we can all work towards get um, a far more sustainable solution. So again, this particular building at the Macquarie University, you can see isn't compromised in design or appearance by this design for deconstruction approach. And uh, the other thing that's really working in our favour at the moment is that we're seeing the development of a whole simple fastening and uh, one of the other things to ensure that the durability of your design and buildings uh, is maintained is to make sure that you are always using the correct fastening techniques. Um, and we have mechanical fasteners these days that makes our life for builders much easier. And the devil is in the detail. So it's important that we actually think about the fasteners and think about the methods in which they're uh, utilized and how they look. Again, this provides another design opportunity to actually integrate um, uh, timber and fastenings in a way that is really attractive and uh, adds value to a building. 
I was in Melbourne a couple of weeks ago and stumbled across this exhibition with the Melbourne Art Gallery, Victorian Art Gallery. And again, to me, it's another example of how timber can be used and particularly in a, in a um, prefabricated and um, uh, using computer generated design. There are just so many opportunities that timber can create from a, an aesthetic and from a contextual. And there are some really exciting developments happening in timber. Moment. And I'm sure CLT, if you've attended some of the previous Wood Solution webinars, you'll become, you'll become familiar in CLT, particularly from a commercial building point of view. But it's exciting to understand that it's now being used domestically as well for individual, for individual homes. And this is actually on the Wood Solutions website. So we're seeing timber being used in a way that it hasn't been before products and new sustainable products that we can use to continue to promote this sustainable material. Uh, interestingly, when you start looking around, you can see that elsewhere uh, in other parts of the world, CLT has really taken off. And in this particular instance, you can see um, that the CLT is actually the roof structure. So if you think about how we traditionally build uh, roofs with trusses and frames and everything, this is a, to me a fantastic solution to think that CLT can just become the structure, the interior finishes and um, deliver a whole um, exciting new design opportunity and method to deliver what I think is a, a far more sustainable solution. So you can see from that little image on the right hand side how by lifting the timber up off the ground and even using CLT as a roof structure, you can get um, a very useful um, solution. This is a Dutch project, but I can see this being utilised in Australia. Um, and again, um, uh, overseas, we're seeing some pretty amazing timber solutions and timber being used in ways that perhaps we haven't thought of here in terms of modular design. And, um, and this again is a design for deconstruction solution whereby this external framing is actually able to be um, taken off um, retained and put back on again. So very different solutions in terms of thinking how we put them together. We've had this idea that buildings are there forever, which the structures of buildings should be, but many of the elements of the buildings can change and be flexible. And again, this is the design aspects of timber that I think make it unique in um, our current workplace and work opportunity. Now, there are many terms that are being thrown around at the moment, and the circular economy is one that many of you have uh, no doubt heard about. But the three principles behind a circular economy is to make sure that you design out waste and pollution, that you keep those products and materials in use, and that you regenerate natural systems. And of course, once again, timber is that material that really allows a circular so I feel really strongly that if we as designers and we as a timber industry really start embracing this new way of thinking, we can, we have the resources in our own country and we can make sure that we reuse and uh, make sure that our resources in this country can continually be maintained and utilised. And the other exciting thing that's become more prevalent is the use of or the understanding of biophilic design, which is where timber and other natural materials um, are utilised in a design sense to get a whole lot of other benefits. And we're realising that it's actually really healthy to, to be surrounded by natural materials and timber. And certainly in the homes that I've lived in, I've actually had indoor testing done, uh, particularly with some of the engineered timber that I've used to prove to myself and my family that these environments can actually be healthier than the traditional materials that we tend to use within our own homes. 
So the finishes we use, the materials we use, and the design approach we take uh, is is exciting to understand that it's we're getting even more value from uh, timber we use. Timber also has a couple of challenges. Being natural and cellular, cellular it tends to move, and in different climatic conditions. Um, I find with the timber door in my own home at the moment, I can tell at different times of the year it expands and contracts. So right now it's just rubbing a little bit, but in summer, um, it, it, um, so it actually tells me the time of the year because after a while you come to understand which moves and which doesn't. But it's also prone to pests, to rot, to mold, to fungi. And it's the understanding of how treatments and everything are used with timber that enable us to get its ultimate benefit. But it's also important to understand that we can have a whole lot of different um, opportunities, but we need to understand these finishes and understand the maintenance of them. There are two slides of two buildings on two different parts of the world where uh, the timber is being deliberately left to age. And I'm not sure about you, but I've had many clients in the past who um, not necessarily want their buildings to look like this, but others who think it's quite magical that you can see the quality of the timber. And in particular, I think um, one of the things I'm not really done particularly well here in Australia is understanding how water runs off material. This is something uh, we need as designers to pay a lot more attention to and understand how um, the finishes we use uh, need to protect the material and, and also have an environmental consideration. So, as I said, the qualities and the expectations of timbers is something that you need to talk with your clients and, uh, and the people using your buildings because in, a lot of people expect timber will look as good as it did the day it was installed. But unless you have and understand the maintenance regimes required, you will find cast aside because people think it's aging unnecessarily. So I've become quite um, particular now about explaining to my clients that unless they maintain the timber and they understand that maintenance is required every five years, um, they're not getting the full value of the timber. And, and also the selection of timbers for their location in terms of where they're going to get not density of the timber is something that I think is really important in greater detail. One of the things that I think we tend to become a little bit lazy uh, with is the understanding of using timber specifications. And I think it's a bit of a problem in our industry at the moment that we just throw a specification together and then pick a particular type of timber solution and then push it on to the builder and say, go away and make this work. And I think this is something where designers need to get a much better understanding of the restrictions that occasionally exist in standard specifications. I think it's really important um, to, to get involved in the specification aspects of the project um, to make sure that um, flashes uh, that often exist in specifications don't become the reason that your builder can come back to you and say, um, I'm this and I have to use this because it's, this is the only thing available. The other thing that Timber uh, makes us think about more and more is some of the health aspects. Although I said before biophilic design is very healthy, we need to be considering the manufacturing of Timber in relation to off-gassing of various uh, glues and things that we're using, and even pest control. So sometimes these elements can actually put a less than ideal environmental um, quality to the timber. And some of the traditional treatments we've used in preserving timber have been fairly toxic. The great news now is that we now have many more environmentally considered solutions 
But again, we need to seek these out because unless you ask for these, you may not be getting exactly what you think. And detailing becomes incredibly important. And I've learnt in the various projects I've been involved in that unless the timber is properly detailed, unless you understand how to protect end grains and allow water to run off timber, you are not getting the maximum value of using the timber. So again, these are some typical details which I'm sure many of you have seen, but like me, you've probably seen many instances where these details are not used. And the, the net effect of that is that we are starting to waste this wonderful material that we have access to and therefore it needs to be replaced more. I had the fortune of going to Japan a number of years ago and I saw buildings over there that are hundreds of years old and to see the attention to detail that they put to from the environment was something that and something that we need to think about more and more in, in our buildings using timber in innovative ways. So design for durability is one of the key things that I think we need to pay more attention to. And the ways to do that is by detailing and using uh, overhanging eaves to protect timber. Sacrificial cappings either used traditionally or in a modern way to, to uh, give added value to the timber and to extend its life. I mentioned before the importance of uh, ventilation and making sure as we start closing our buildings up using passive house techniques, we need to make sure that we have considered the appropriate movement and ventilation of timber. And therefore, we're not creating moisture traps. And obviously any protective finish we use, we need to understand the life of that finish. And then at the end of its life, is it going to be completely replaced or designed for deconstruction? Or does it have to be um, treated in a way? And is the servicing of that something that's been included in the design? Now, another thing that I'm rather passionate about is using local timber. And I think this is one of the best ways to demonstrate a local economy concept. It's the way that we support our regional communities. And uh, I've come to learn through my involvement in Responsible Wood, independent director, that our timber industry is probably amongst the most regulated um, industry in the world. And that some of the challenges that Timber has had in the past, um, they're being overcome, those challenges of environmental concerns that perhaps existed 20 or 30 years ago. And one of the key things that we're understanding now is the carbon benefit. And the good news is that most Australians are now associating wood as an environmentally friendly material and as a carbon store. So all of these timber buildings that um, I hope we're all developing become carbon sinks and they become uh, a benefit to our society and our community and to our environment. But there's still concern about um, issues of deforestation or, or deforestation. And these are the sort of issues that we need to be conscious of and make sure that we're doing our part in specifying timber. The thing I've become aware of is that the amount of greenhouse gas and emissions that are associated with burning timber from overseas, which is now uh, equating to 3.1% of global greenhouse emissions, is predicted to go up to 10%. And that's the, the cost of transport and shipping around the world, which again is another reason why we should be using local timber. I think it's interesting to understand that uh, forest harvesting isn't necessarily a pretty thing, but if done well and managed well, uh, it, it actually achieves great outcomes. And uh, as Alistair reminded me when I was talking about this picture on the left, uh, which is an example of uh, responsible timber harvesting, he said it, it sort of reminds you every time you 
no building and you need to clear a block of land. In the past, we used to clear the entire block. Now we need to think about topsoil and vegetation. So this approach that has been adopted in the industry, we're now thinking about more and more our individual rights in terms of trying to protect and maintain some of the benefits of what's been there before. I think it's interesting to see how um, environments are regenerated. So this is a harvesting site done in 1988. Five years later, you can see the prolific regrowth. And then some 17 years later, it's an amazing regeneration of the forest. And I think it's important to understand now that we have one of the best forest management systems in the world that um, we should be proud that the systems and the mechanisms that we've adopted in our country uh, uh, have delivered a good industry for us to use. And the other thing which is always very topical is that we're keeping jobs in our country by using the local resources. What are the criteria for sustainable forest management? It, it's um, important to understand that uh, when we talk about management, there are so many different factors that are brought in or considered. So we think about the biological diversity of the forests. We think about um, water resources and contribution to carbon cycles, both nationally and internationally. So I've come to learn and feel very strongly that um, as responsible and environmental designers, we should be using timber from certified sources. And one of the things I really want to stress today is unless you are using timber, from one of these two global sources, FFC being the Forest Stewardship Council or PEFC, you do not have any guarantee that the timber that you're using is not coming means that unless you have ensured that your timber is coming from a certified source, you really have no way of knowing whether that timber is actually legal timber, it's been um, uh, imported from a, an illegal logging point of view, from a modern slavery point of view. So I really believe we have a moral responsibility now to make sure that the timber we use always comes from a certified source. And responsible wood is the um, Australian certified source that you should be looking out for. What responsible wood certification means that that timber does come from a 100% uh, sustainable managed forest, that it's legal, and it also comes through a chain of custody system so it can be validated that the timber has actually come from a sustainable source. It's important to understand that um, uh, certified timber is not as prolifically um, available as uh, we think it is. And what I mean by that it is available but it's often substituted by non-certified timber. And so one needs to be really careful when designing your building and out on site to make sure that what you have specified is actually being delivered. Um, here in Australia, we have um, some amazing local timber, gum, black bark, Victorian ash, and Tasmanian um, hope, to name a few, that are the basis of our certified timber um, solutions. So most of the engineered timber made in Australia also comes from And PEFC, which is the body that um, uh, uh, Responsible Wood is associated with, has got some amazing initiatives at the moment to make sure that it's sourcing trees from responsible sources, not just within forests, but also outside forests. One of the questions that you often gets asked is, do we have enough timber for the future? 
Uh, I guess this is a problem we have with all of our building resources. Do we have enough? Because the world is rapidly uh, using uh, its finite resources. I'm happy to say that um, we do have enough, but it's only enough if we make sure that it comes from sustainably certified management system. And we have some good examples around the world whereby um, other countries have really embraced the timber industry and made it a national part of their economy. And I really think Australia needs to follow the example of such uh, countries and actually really take on board this desire to use timber and use it and to support the industries. To understand that um, we are running out of timber is quite important. We are currently planting more trees than we are taking out. And this is something also that we tend to forget that unless we are using timber from sustainable sort of certified sources, we can be contributing to the problem, not helping the problem. So how do you find out what is certified timber and how do you find out what is sustainable timber? Well, there are some fantastic guides available to us and the Wood Solutions people um, are, are also at the forefront of making sure that a lot of timber is certified and comes from sustainable sources. It's not just in Green Star projects and various environmental projects where we should be thinking about um, not just the certification of timber, but the, the certainty that the timber is actually being supplied as what's been specified. I encourage that you have a look at um, the eco specifier guides. It gives you a really good overview of how you can use sustainable timber, not just for framing, but for windows and doors. And I think the other thing to understand is that um, our society is making decisions not always on sustainability, but on durability and on occupant satisfaction and on visual aesthetics before environmental issues are actually thought about. As designers, we need to make sure that we're bringing the environmental qualities to the solution in a way that we have, I think, a professional responsibility. So we're faced in our current day with uh, a lot of natural disasters and the thought is our timber resource um, and the answer is yes but one of the amazing qualities that timber has is that uh, here in Australia we've been able to salvage a lot of the timber in certified forests that were affected by uh, those catastrophic, catastrophic fires that we've had recently. So again, it's important to understand that by using local and supporting local, local timber, we've actually got circular systems in place to ensure that we can Conscious of time, and uh, I also just want to point out that um, many of our timber suppliers and everything are the right thing in terms of bringing out sustainable timber producing policies. It's always important to understand that some of these policies don't always get implemented in the way that you might think. Um, so um, if you note down the um, bottom of this particular slide, it says by December 2020, all timber and our products originating from originate from third-party certified forests, FC or PFC. Now, fortunately, Bunnings and a number of other organisations have done a great job in actually delivering this. But um, if you're thinking about using local timber, understand that um, local timber is only a small timber that is supplied through organisations. It's great to see now that uh, responsible one of the FC is now starting to feature on the marketing material um, for many of our suppliers. And again, it's important to make sure you look for this because if you don't look for it, you may not be getting it. But COVID has also had an impact and it's having a supply chain issue. 
um, and giving a number of organisations the opportunity to delay some of the policies or to delay some of the programs that they had. So uh, once again, now more so than ever, it's important to make sure that we are getting uh, timber funds that are applied to Our solutions for the future are to use more local timber, to use reclaimed timber wherever possible, to ensure that timber is detailed correctly, and to understand that engineered timber is a lot more sustainable than steel, concrete and plastic. We need to make sure the timber treatments and the toxicity issues uh, that are associated with timber are not polluting and there are many good around now that go a long way to solving these problems and over the next um, uh, over the future we should be thinking about this concept of design for deconstruction and understanding that we should never throw out a piece of timber but it should always be positioned for recycling now something uh, just coming up in terms of being aware of maintenance and everything is understanding how many products have warranties but again, unless those warranties are activated, we don't get the full benefit of um, the uh, timber and the, uh, the service life that is possible. And I think it's also really important to make sure that uh, when you look for some of these, uh, through some of this information, the wording is such that it says, we encourage our suppliers, we will strive to reduce we will continue to participate in schemes and that's why I've learned that it's so important to be getting the documentation uh, to make sure that the things are actually being delivered because there are many people out there that will tell you that they're using certification but they won't actually be able to deliver the evidence that it has been used. So I guess I'm really here to advocate that we should be using Australian timber we need to make sure that our timber is uh, from a certified source and that uh, to be absolutely certain that you get the ultimate benefit from wood, you need to design well, you need to specify well, you can't accept verbal assurances, you need to get the paperwork to make sure that what you are asking for is being delivered. Design for deconstruction gives us the opportunity to plan for the next life. And I think that um, we need to keep better records of how we're using timber to ensure that we're getting the maximum benefit from it. I'm happy to say that Wood Solutions and a number of other people in the timber industry are doing a great job in terms of getting some of the environmental messages and some of the renewability messages out but it's up to us as designers and specifiers to make sure that we actually can ensure that the ultimate benefits of timber are delivered. So I'll finish up there and um, I hope um, I've given you a bit of an outline of how important I think it is that we do use local timber, we use certified timber and we understand that timber is a material that we can get the ultimate benefit from if we follow for certain principles. So over, you, over to you, Alistair. Thanks, Mark. That was fantastic. So well done. Um, so if we've got questions for people online, please uh, type them in. We've got a few questions here, but if you've got others, please put them in. We'll get through as many as we can. Um, so Mark, um, you mentioned uh, earlier on when you were talking about your own home you built that you used LVL studs uh, rather than softwood studs. Uh, we've got a question from Franklin just asking why perhaps we don't see more LVL studs used rather than sawn softwood. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I think the simple solution is uh, there's a perception that it's dearer. But I think when you design it correctly, the added strength that you get from LVL means that you don't need to use as much of it as if you're using conventional timber. So what I learned in my own home, uh, my first home, was that you can actually use timber really efficiently. So the engineered products like LVL and glue lamb and everything give you the opportunity to use timber, uh, well, you have to design it that way but uh, you can use it a lot more efficiently. And I'm very clear that the materials that I put in my first home would have cost maybe 
five or ten percent more than conventional construction, but by designing it well, that benefit um, was counteracted, and in fact, it became a very economical way to build because of the way it was built and designed. Mm. That's a good point. And also when we speak to builders, sometimes they uh, they speak about how sawn timber can often move and they have to straighten it. Yet with LVL, it's quite stable. There's a lot less movement. So it might cost you a little bit more, but there's less actual effort in, you know, perhaps coming back and reframing up or straightening up your walls. Hmm. Well, the great thing about my first house is that it was entirely uh, assembled on the site and the footings were poured later. So the whole house could be leveled and positioned to be perfect. And then the footings, because it was all propped up on everything, uh, the footings were the last thing that were poured. And the house uh, to this day is dead level straight and uh, um, an incredibly strong structure. Mm. You also uh, mentioned, Mark, about um, doing residential homes using cross laminated timber or, or plywood. And Roger asks, uh, how's the best way to accommodate services there, such as plumbing or electrical, integrating that uh, into the frame of the home? Look, I, I've found, and uh, I'm a Queensland architect, so uh, we have a tendency here to lift things up off the ground, and particularly on sloping sites, using that space under houses for services and, and everything is the ideal thing. Um, but certainly with services and CLT, um, it is a case of... Um, the, the most common thing I've seen done is CLT being used on one side as a finished surface and then possibly a cavity or something on the other side to conceal services um, with another lining. But upon saying that, again, it comes down to design. Um, it's really important to, to think about where all your services are going. My very first home, I was concerned about electromagnetic radiation. So we actually thought about where all the wiring was going in the house. And by actually thinking about these things um, in an early sense, we actually saved money by reducing the amount of um, service that we used in the house just by thinking the whole process went through. Mm -hmm. so, so again, it comes down to early thinking and an understanding that you're trying to be as efficient as possible and um, and also have built in a little bit of um, uh, agility for future change. And the great thing about lifting houses up off the ground is that you've always got access under. So I'm not a great uh, fan for slab on ground. Yep. Um, James asks, uh, when you were talking about sort of circular economy and, and end of life, if you might want to comment uh, on preservative treated products and, you know, what we can do there in terms of reuse and recycling at end of life. Well, that's why I feel so strongly about keeping good records of materials, because I've seen a lot of timber potentially thrown away because there's been some question mark as to what the treatment of the timber has been. If you understand what the treatment is, you can then uh, take the appropriate precautions for it. As I've said before, we're finding a lot more uh, treatments that are, uh, shall we say, friendlier to the environment than past treatment. But one of the consequences is, is they may need more maintenance or more attention. And this is why the whole design for deconstruction um, approach becomes really relevant because sometimes it's possible to remove something, treat it, and then put it back as opposed to completely throw something away. So it's a completely different mindset that I believe we need to be thinking about in terms of we used to build forever now, and I've come from a background of uh, commercial interior design where fit outs can often be done every five years. The wastage that I've seen in that industry is just criminal. So I think we need to think in our domestic industry or our domestic construction, that changes get made, you know, um, alterations to houses are made on a re fairly regular basis. Um, so to actually be thinking that, um, you, you can actually take a wall out and plug another wall back and actually do something else with those materials rather than wasting them is a mindset that we need to be adopting from here on in. Yep. 
Just one more question before we finish up. Um, Scott asks uh, or sort of mentions that he's noticed in America they're starting to build external walls, walls using 140 deep studs spaced at 600 centres. So this allows for extra insulation to be uh, put in, giving a wall a greater R value. Uh, and he's just asking, what do you think about that being utilised over here and would it sort of meet our sort of standards and practices here in Australia? Uh, as you've heard me say before, I'm not a great believer in what I call composite construction, where you actually sandwich, uh, or, or sorry, products are made so that things are stuck together. I'm a great believer with insulation to use um, uh, either foil insulation um, as sarking and the like, and then to use air. So um, there are some quite interesting insulation um, materials around natural insulation materials that are always worthwhile. But coming back to your question, I think the wider um, a, a, a structural wall is, the greater the opportunity for insulation, for sound insulation, for thermal insulation. So I, I think again, um, Building up this idea of layering facades is going to be the solution that we'll come to adopt in terms of uh, better thermal insulation. And I also think it's important to understand that um, uh, insulation is something that needs attention from time to time as well, particularly if it ever gets wet. So again, having access to that uh, a la design for deconstruction. If you can pull panels off and inspect things or check insulation, it's something that I think uh, is, is a good thing to do. So as you've probably gathered, I'm actually advocating that we've got to stop and think about the way we're building at the moment and rethink um, a solution that's going to give us uh, better thermal insulation, better, better environmental solutions, and uh, thicker walls is one of the ways to um, to so That's fantastic. We're, just, we're, just, we're just over 12 o'clock, so uh, we might uh, stop there. So thank you once again for an excellent presentation uh, on behalf of all the people attending today. Um, just a couple of points um, for, for those attending. I uh, remind you again, if you want to see a re-recording of this or see any of the other uh, webinars that uh, certainly they're available from the Wood Solutions website. So just uh, go to that link there under resources and click on that and you can certainly access them. Also, you'll find on the Wood Solutions website a whole range of other resources you might be interested in, including some of our new in-focused uh, videos that uh, we've been putting together recently. Um, so our next webinars in two weeks time on the 8th of June and the topic then is advanced prefabricated architecture. And the presenters there will be Ben Attrell and Andrew Fatir from, from Arkit, and that will be a, a really interesting uh, um, um, presentation uh, that day about the different types of architectural prefabricated buildings that are available now in Australia. So, so don't miss that one. So uh, I thank you once again. Thank you, Mark. And uh, uh, we'll sign off now, but uh, we look forward to seeing you all again in, uh, in two weeks' time.